studied the book of Numbers in a class. And I know many of you are thinking, how are we ever going to spend a quarter on a boring book like Numbers? <laughs> how many people, let's mess up now, have started in Numbers, you get to the first chapter, and you go, oh, let's go to the next book. <laughs> it can be difficult. Uh, and in fact, when you start thinking about it, um, it, it gets its name from the fact that there are two census records that are in the book. Uh, the Hebrew name is actually in the wilderness. I, I like that one better. And it comes from the first uh, book, the first chapter, where it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. Uh, they're still located at the base of Mount Sinai. Uh, we ended up with Exodus, uh, with them having constructed the tabernacle, uh, having erected it there. And it took them almost a year from the time they got out of Egypt until they had the tabernacle set up. They just finished their first Passover. And Numbers sort of picks up from there. And if we look at where that's located, uh, let's see, there we go. Um, we're right after the Exodus, so we're still kind of in that same time period. But it's going to cover about a 40-year period there. And everybody knows why it's 40 years, right? Um, because things happen. And it turns out there's a lot of stuff in Numbers that is familiar. We just always forget that that's the book that it's in. Anybody remember some of the things in the book of Numbers? What happens in Numbers? Besides the census, I already gave you that one. The other census. The other census, okay. <laughs> gave you that one too. Yeah? Isn't that where uh, the 12 tribes are given their spaces where they're going to be? Absolutely. we got this camp. They set up the order there. That's where things start getting laid out as to, to how they're going to sort of organize themselves. What else? What's that? Yeah, yeah, with the serpent in the wilderness that the, the, the came into. So we got some, some rebellion going on because that's where that came from. Turns out there's a lot of stories there. And it's all part of this march, right? If you're thinking about where, where they're going... Um, they've got, they started out in Egypt, they're down here somewhere, down in Sinai, they're eventually supposed to get up here and, and conquer this land, um, but for now, they're, they're right here, and this is about a, 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 a it's called a play in four acts, okay? Um, the first thing they're going to do is talk about all, well, they're camped around Mount Sinai, and then there's this journey piece from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. And then it's going to talk about 38 years that they spend in Kadesh Barnea. And then there's going to be another trek from Kadesh to the plains of Moab. And then we just get the introduction of them in the plains of Moab just before they move into the, uh, the promised land, into the conquest under Joshua. So historically, uh, right after Numbers comes Joshua. We also skip Leviticus. Why did we skip Leviticus? Because we already studied that before. Um, it, it, Leviticus was the book of the priest. Leviticus is a book of the law. And so we're just kind of continuing this history here. You know, while we got dust on our sandals, let's continue to walk down this path and, and see where, they, where the Israelites went, what it was that drove them, uh, the, the mistakes that they made, the good things that they did. Uh, that's what we'll see a lot of here. When we get into this, you're also going to see that there are times when you wonder, why in the world did this chapter come here? It'll be giving some history stuff, and then all of a sudden it starts talking about some law things, and then it'll talk about some more history things, and then suddenly there'll be descriptions of ceremonies and things that happen, and it gets kind of interleaved. And I think what we'll see 
is that ceremony and law was very important to them, as we've already studied in Exodus. And we'll talk more about it when we get to each instance, but think of it as their ceremonies that they underwent was part of the ritual that was being built into them so that they would be have a, 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 something built into their lives to remind them of God, to remind them of what they were doing. And sometimes we don't quite give as much heed these days to ritual and to ceremony as what I think historically it has meant. We, we sort of like to do things these days, right? Do we still have any ceremonies in this country that are, have any kind of meaning? What kind of ceremonies do we have? Mm -hmm. Weddings. Wedding ceremonies, right? Why do we make such a big deal about a wedding ceremony? Marriage is a big deal. Marriage is a big deal. Exactly right. The point is, we are we built a lot of traditions and ceremony around something that is very important and that we want people to remember. What's one of the key things in a wedding ceremony? Things of vows, right? So why are all these people there? What are they called? Witnesses. Witnesses. Okay, so that's part of that. Now, it, we have a number of folks here who are in the military. Any ceremonies in the military? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we name them all? Okay, we'd be here for a while, right? Uh, starting in the morning. What do you have in the first thing in the morning? Make your bed. Yeah, well, it's reveille, right? You got to get up, you got to get things done, and, and there's an order to how things are going to be done, right? And then what happens at the end of every day? Tax. Tax. It's the end of the day. And that's why are those ceremonies there? Well, in the military, it's part of creating a unit, is it not? It is making something so that everyone is doing the same thing and everyone understands that they're part of the same group, that they're on the same side, that they've got similar goals and structures. That's what it's for. And we're going to find out that a lot of what God instituted here for the ceremonies of their religion that he was putting forth for them was for exactly the same reasons. And that they were essential for that group because they came out from where? They just came from the land of Egypt. They've only been out of Egypt for a year. What was the main religion in Egypt? Trick question. They got idols, okay? So just pick an idol, uh, which one of the gods, and they've each got their own temples, and they've each got their own priests, and they've each got their own ceremonies, and all of that kind of stuff. That's what they were used to. That's what they grew up with. So we start with this first chapter. We start by figuring out that we've got to get things organized. Now, I want you to, we're just going to read a couple of verses here, but the same language is used multiple times. And it starts out with, take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel by their families, by their fathers' households, according to the numbers of names, every male, head by head, from 20 years old and upward, Whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. With you, moreover, there shall be a man of each tribe, each of the head of his father's household. Now, it's very tempting to start skipping at this point, because now we have a bunch of names that are very difficult to pronounce. These are the names of the men who will stand up with you. Reuben, Elazor, the son of Shedor, of Simeon, Shalumal, the son of Zerishadai. You notice I just say them with confidence, and then <laughs> you believe them. Of Judah, Nashon, the son of Minadab, of Issachar, Nathanael, the son of Zur, of Zebulun, Eliab, the uh, son of Helen. And he goes on down and just keeps going with all of these names. But I want you, as you're kind of glancing through there, how many of those names have an, and you might be tempted to just quit at that, but I want you to just dissect it for just a second. How many of those names have E-L in them? Quite a few of them, right? What is E-L? L. That is God. Okay? It is one of the names of God. These people are bearing, many of them, the names of God. I'll just put three on the slide here. Uh, Elazor is the God is my rock, or my God is, is a rock. Uh, Shedor, uh, El Shaddai is a light. Shemuel, El, God is my salvation. And it just goes on down from there if you start looking up the roots of what those names mean. 
Which is interesting because God was silent for most of their time in Egypt, was he not? We had his guidance. The last one that's recorded in the book of Genesis was with Joseph, who was going down and who was able to interpret dreams and God revealed things to. But between Joseph and Moses, you know, 400 years. And in that 400 years, these people are still keeping the thoughts and the traditions and those views of the patriarchs that they remembered of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob alive, even through their names. And it's also interesting that you don't see any forms of the name of Yahweh, which you do see later on. But if you remember in the book of Exodus, where God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush, and the statement was made there, Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am, but I will make known to you my name that has not been known in Israel. If you look at Exodus, the sixth chapter, verse three, he says, by the name of Yahweh, this is my true name. But God was known by many names, each one that meant something a little different in terms of the protector and, and the savior and those kinds of things that were all built into the various names. But El Shaddai was the most common one that you'll find in, in Genesis going through. And it is that L that winds its way into many of the names that we have in the patriarchs. So I find that interesting. That here we are 400 years later, and the names still reflect that they are keeping touch with their memories of God. Now, also looking at these men, it's talking about leaders of the tribes and of the households. The heads of the tribes. And it might be tempting to say that God's naming them to pick them out. But I think rather he's naming them to record them here. Which has another interesting sort of uh, I don't know, inference that we have to make. Where we say these people were keeping track of their tribes and their lineage during this 400 year period. They knew who, which tribe they were part of. They knew who the head of that tribe was. And when he starts talking about by families, by groups, by so on down the line, there was an organization already in place that they would understand and know. And God is calling all that organization to say, now it's time to start numbering people. And so they get everybody together. And beginning down in verse 20, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, their genealogical registration by their families, by their father's households, according to the number of the names, head by head, every male, 20 years old and upward, whoever is able to go to war. Their number of men of the tribe of Reuben were 46,500. Now that same formula is going to be repeated 12 times. So in the essence of time, we are not going to read all 12 of them. But tell me what you get out of just that, those kind of verses. There's a couple of interesting things buried in there. What jumps out at you? When I read it, uh, I found out that when I, they go through and they name all the 12 uh, tribes, who's going to be the leader, I kind of got out that the, there's an organizational chart being built, and therefore, if the people understand where they fit in this chart, there is no argument or fighting amongst them. Okay, so we definitely have the beginning of the organization of the people for what they've got to do to come forward. What else do you get out of just uh, out of that word? Who are they numbering? Young men 25. Males, 20 years old and upward. Now it turns out if you go over uh, to uh, Leviticus, the 27th chapter, you'll find that the span there was 20 to 60. Okay, which means that I'm just over having to go to war here if uh, uh, 65 counts anymore these days. Um, so yeah, it's anybody they said was able to go to war. So this is a military organization as well, is it not? But that's kind of the stance that they're going to go to. What does that sort of foreshadow? I mean, if things had worked out, where is their next stop after Mount Sinai? Canaan. 
they got to go in, they got land to conquer, right? So how do you conquer the land? You got to get your army together. So this is the beginning of that. What else? I think also uh, by saying that only 20 and above could go to war, it also, I mean, we know that during that time, you know, uh, uh, when they went to war, a lot of people died because of the nature that they fought the wars. And so therefore, by leaving people who are uh, the men who are 20 and under, uh, it gives them the opportunity to, to uh, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, Rebuild, <laughs> repopulate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was certainly part of it. It was also, you know, just in, in their view of growing up um, and when you were responsible for things. Uh, it turns out that you weren't really classed as a full sort of male uh, to be regarded much until you were 30, but between 30, 20 and 30, there were other responsibilities that you would begin to take on. Uh, you could get married, you could start having a family. In fact, it's fun, fun fact there, if they got married, uh, they got a year off, okay? They got a year off for a honeymoon uh, and didn't have to go to war for a year. Uh, so I can imagine there were a lot of 20 year olds who were really looking for a wife about the time they got to Canaan. Uh, but it's interesting if you start looking through all of the numbers, and, and I put a bunch of numbers up here, and you may or may not be able to see all of them, um, but we've got a couple things. Uh, this is right after the Exodus, all the numbers here from uh, chapter 1, and then chapter 26, you've got all of these numbers that come up, and over here in this column, which is off the screen just a little bit, you can see it better here on this one, um, that is the change. Anything in parenthesis is a drop, which I found kind of interesting. Of course, you know, math, I had to go do this. Uh, Simeon, as a tribe, is down by 60% by the time they have 40 years in the wilderness. Well, that's, kind of, that's kind of interesting. And Manasseh has grown by about 60%. So while the numbers wind up being kind of close, the mixtures in the tribes changed a lot. And I kind of found that interesting from a couple of standpoints. Simeon is a tribe that's going to basically get absorbed into Judah as time goes on here. Uh, and pretty soon, in the, in the context of the history, you almost lose track uh, of Simeon. Uh, so this was kind of the beginning of them going away. And if you look at some of the prophecies that even given by Jacob for what was going to be with his sons, uh, with Simeon was one of the ones that was involved with this, uh, with Reuben and Simeon in the uh, murder of all of the people that had, uh, you know, raped their sister. Uh, and so, while they were the next of kin avengers of blood, they took things a bit too far, and that's what they were being uh, called down for. So, um, they had by head simple meaning there. We kind of get everyone, right? But he's got this organization. They repeat that multiple times. So let's keep that in mind. They understood this familial relationship. And that's going to come out in, in, in a little bit when we get a little further along uh, with their next level of responsibility. So they count everybody up. Uh, the first chapter is all about counting. If you get down to verse 46 in the first chapter, it says, even all the number of men were 603,550. Now, I don't know what the statistical distribution was of the families and things back then, but the guesstimate is that that would put the total population, because this is just the men between 20 and 60, put the total population somewhere around 2 million. Rough number. That's a lot of people. Population of San Antonio inside the 1604 Beltway. Is rapidly changing. But last I looked, it was about 1.4 million. Okay? So even if this was just doubled out of 1.2, it'd be like everybody inside of 1604 packing up and marching off to Houston. Okay, maybe down to Big Ben in the Chihuahua Desert would be a better analogy, right? <laughs> but can you imagine? That's a pile of people! And, and, and the logistics of how you support that many people and all the things that they're carrying along. It's no wonder that it took them months to get down to, to Sinai. They've been there just kind of recovering for a while. They're in a desert. How in the world are they feeding everybody? Manna. Manna from heaven. Let's not forget that this is the time period when God is taking care of their needs. 
Every morning when they get up, guess what? Breakfast is out on the ground. All they got to do is go pick it up. They got tired of it after a while, but, you know, they, they had sustenance. They had God taking care of them in that way. So they go through that, and then, it, beginning in verse 47, it talks about this exemption for the Levites. Uh, and then it's going to talk about the arrangement of the camp. So I wanna, let's talk about the Levites for just a second, and then we'll come back to the, to the camp. They were not numbered among the men by their father's tribe, because the Lord had spoken to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor shall you take their census among the sons of Israel. Now, one of the important points there is, is my previous slide. I have 12 names there. And there were 12 sons of Israel, and Levi's not on there. So how did we get the 12 names? Which one's missing? Joseph, Joseph is missing. And who do we have instead? Ephraim and Manasseh. And the reason there is, Jacob, being the ornery guy that he was, decided he wanted to give the firstborn double portion to Joseph. And the way he sort of rigged doing that was on his deathbed, he adopted Joseph's sons. And so by adopting them, and if you go read that, where he had the hands crossed instead of being Manasseh and Ephraim, or wherever there were after it was Ephraim and Manasseh, um, he said, these are my sons. And so by doing that, they became part of the 12. We now had 13 tribes instead of 12. But Levi didn't get a portion. And so here he's talking specifically about the Levites. They were not to be numbered. So why wouldn't they be numbered in that first census? The first census was numbering people ready to do what? Go to war. By implication, who didn't go to war? The Levites. Okay? They had a different duty. Now it turns out they had to learn military skills and things too, but their job was to protect the tabernacle. Is it, uh, when, when it comes down to it. So, we have the Levites there. Uh, they are appointed over the tabernacle of the testimony, over all of its furnishings, over all the belongs to it. They're supposed to carry the tabernacle. Uh, when it's set out, the Levites take it down. When it, they recant, the Levites set it up. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. Now, there's one of those interesting statements right in the middle of that. So, we've got the Levites are now responsible for the tabernacle. He's going to go into more details on that later. But doesn't that sentence kind of jump out to you? The layman who comes near. What was the penalty? Death. Death. Who do you think is enacting that penalty? God is the one who prescribed it. It's the Levites who have to carry it out. They are the boundary around the tabernacle to keep nosy people out. Now, could other people come into the tabernacle? Absolutely, if you have purpose, but basically saying, this is a holy space, and I'm going to dedicate these people to take care of that holy space. And when he says, the layman coming near, what he's saying is, it's time to pack up. Can you imagine, you know, somebody would go, you know, I'd really like to serve God, and we've got to pack up this thing, and, and I can go help. And you think, why not? You know, from a human standpoint, that that sounds fine. You know, I'm going to help God. I'm going to, I'm going to go pack this thing up and give those Levites a hand. But that wasn't their job. And it just shows you that people quite often come up with things and think about what they think would be a good idea without thinking about what God says is a good idea. God said, you leave that place alone. This is a holy place. This is a holy space set aside dedicated, the Levites will handle it. And so verse 53, it says, the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of testimony so that there will be no wrath on the congregation of the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall keep charge of the tab tabernacle of testimony, thus the sons of Israel did, according to all which the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. So, here we go. We've got to figure out how they're going to, yeah, question? I'm sorry, yeah, just to satisfy my curiosity. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, really good question, and it talks about that a little later on. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get there, but I'll go ahead and talk about it a little bit, because, yeah, that was an interesting job. And, and he had jobs for each one of the tribes, right? Um, in fact, hang on just a second, and we'll get there, because I, it, it, 
it, it's interesting how that happened. Some of it was covered and protected, some of it wasn't. Um, but everybody had a job to do when it came time to, to move the tent. So we get them all there. They were to be camping around it. It's kind of hard to read the thing, but hopefully we can see it a little bit. Um, we've, we've got the Levites that are on all sides of it. And then he's going to, in the next couple of chapters, talk about where all of the tribes camped. And so on the eastern side, right out here, we have the priests and Moses. Uh, and then we have Iskar, Judah, and Zebul. And then on the north side, you've got Asher and Dan and Naphtali. Uh, then on the west side, you've got Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And then the Levites around it with them, Gad and Reuben and Simeon. Now, it talks about those being, okay, these are on the north, these are on the south, and so on, in the way it's described. But then it still leaves us with, how was it really arranged? Because it might have been arranged with camps like this, you know, sort of sequential, or you might have an arrangement where they're staggered out from each other. Lots of people like this arrangement because they think it looks like a cross, and they want it to be some sort of symbolic future thing. I'm sorry, uh, we don't know, you know, uh, and sometimes we go looking for symbols when there aren't any, uh, so let's not, uh, just no sense going there, we just know that somewhere on the north, or was it more like, you know, this, and it, go on the internet sometime and look for images of the tribes arranged around the tabernacle, uh, and you'll find just tons and tons of pictures for how all of that might have looked, but the main thing is, you think about the tabernacle as a quarter of the size of a football field, all right? So Alamo Dome is downtown. We got something a quarter of the size of the Alamo Dome in the middle of the city. And how far out are we spread to get 1.2 million people? So while that is the center of their worship, they're spread out a pretty good ways. You just physically have to do that from a sanitary standpoint, logistical standpoint, to manage that many people. So they're, they're camped all over. The Levites, when they were numbered then, had a different thing in mind. So chapter 2 talks about the arrangement of the camp. We won't really talk about that much more because it had all of the armies and the listings and the numbers repeated there again. Uh, but again, this time it's calling them armies. Um, as they're training together, it, it, anybody that's been in the military understands it's, there's, there's a hierarchy, right? What's the smallest kind of working unit in the military? Platoon. Platoon, but that's pretty good size, right? Even within a platoon, if you're kind of working together, do things get broken down further than that? A squad. Yeah, yeah. So, and how many people are in that? Uh, about eight, ten per squad. Okay, typically anywhere from four to ten, right? And then you got multiples of those that make up a platoon. And in each level, there's somebody in charge, right? And, and there's the hierarchy then that moves on up through the ranks until you get up to the person that's in charge of all of the army. So like in, you know, each war we've had some general that was kind of in charge of that. Uh, who's the general in charge of the army here? Aaron? Yeah, not, not, come on. Right hand man of Moses, Joshua. He's the one that's going to lead them into the land. Right? Remember when they came out and they had to the make get their first fight, he told Joshua, you take charge here and get those people out. So I don't know what kind of military training Joshua had, but obviously he's, I don't know if he's learning on the job or what, but he's responsible for all of this, but he needs a hierarchy. And so it starts talking about that army and that hierarchy down. They're going to be training in those units. They are going to be turning into a military force. But can you imagine if <coughs> slaves are getting turned into a military force, and they've had basically a year, and then they're gonna take off in a few months and go up, you know, maybe a, a 18 months to two years max before they're supposed to engage in war. How well trained are they gonna be? Well, we're gonna think about that when we get to that point in numbers where they're all going into the land, they're looking at armies of all of these kings and things that are in this land, and they go, we can't take it. I can kind of understand them. Right? It's like, wait, we don't really have the armor they have. We don't have the military discipline or training that they have. God said the same thing. He didn't want them to rush into the land. He wanted to keep them out in the wilderness and toughen them up a little bit. He did that, but he also told them, don't worry about it, right? Because I'm going to fight for you. 
It, you go in and do like I tell you, and I'll do the real fighting. We'll get to that in numbers. That's another great story in numbers. Okay, so the, the second chapter deals with that, and then we talk about the Levites and the priesthood there. And they number the sons of Levi by their father's households and families, every male from a month old and upward, you shall number. Well, that's kind of interesting, a month old and upward. That's a different sort of criteria. And the first thing was to get all of the Levites, Levites number. And this wasn't the ones that could serve, this was just a count of all of the Levi males. Well, why is that? Well, you go a little bit further on, he goes, we got to number the firstborn. We're going to number all of the firstborn of the sons of Israel from a month old and upward and make a list of their names. Anybody remember why that's going to be? What did he say? Number the sons of Israel, the firstborn of the sons of Israel. Should be ringing lots of bells from Exodus here. What happened during the last plague? Firstborn was killed. Firstborn of all of Egypt were killed, right? How about the firstborn among Israel? They belong to God. God said, This plague should have taken all of the firstborn, but because you put the blood on the lentils, on the doorposts, I have not taken your firstborn, but they're mine. Now, what do we do here when something belongs to God? Normally, if a sheep or a cow or a firstborn of them was dedicated to God, belonged to God, what did they do with it? Sacrifice. They sacrificed it, right? They killed it. Obviously, God is not wanting human sacrifice, so instead, what do they have to do? Serve. They have to, <coughs> key word here, Redeem it. They have to redeem it. Okay? And so when we think about that concept of redemption there, this is just a carry-on here in Leviticus, the third chapter, of the concept that was started in Exodus at the, at the last plague there. And so he says to number them. Now, one of the things that you'll find if you go through this is uh, as, you, as you count up, and it gives us a total of 22,000, but if you add all these numbers, it comes up to 22,300. Uh, likelihood is that this is textual corruption of, of the number six there, which should have been a number three. There's like a teeny piece of ink that's the difference between a six and a three there, so that's the one that they assume is probably corrupted, because the number 22,000 shows up multiple times. So they number all the Levites, month old and upward, they get 22,000 of them. Firstborn in Israel, you get 22,273. And God said, tell you what, I'll swap. The Levites will be mine. That was the redemption price for the first 22,000 of the firstborn of Israel. But you got 273 left over. So what do you do with them? You pay the redemption price. It's five shekels. That was the price that had to be paid. And it was their redeemer, the next of kin, which in this case would have been their fathers, who was responsible for paying that. And so the concept of redeemer here was really kind of interesting because it was, it was a duty that was taken on. It was the one closest relative who could do for you what you couldn't do for yourself month old baby they can't do anything right the father takes care of it someone sold into slavery it's the redeemer next of kin that is responsible for trying to get them out someone's husband dies who's responsible for taking on the family that's left it's the redeemer the next of kin right and we see that in, in the story of Ruth as Boaz wants to take on that responsibility, but he says, there's somebody who's a closer relative than I am, they get first shot at fulfilling their duty. So let's understand that, that the Redeemer here was a duty that was taken on by the next of kin. God says, we're going to swap here. These Levites effectively are selling themselves to God to redeem out the first 22,000. So they're acting as the redeemers for these others. 
But then the 273, the fathers have to pay up. What I always wondered was how they pick the 273. Did they just kind of randomly choose from the names? Or did you just go down the list for both and whoever happened to be on the end of the list, it's like, whoops, we're out here. <laughs> the fathers have to pay up. Um, either way, they worked it out so that they were redeemed and they became, the Levites then became God's servants. So now as we look at the Levites, they get split up into a couple of different parts. Um, I should have had this one out there. If, if you look at this, this 273, that's in uh, chapter 3, verses 44 and uh, 45. Um, the redemption price uh, is the way the ESV translates it. I like the way that, that's done. All right. So now the duties of the Levites. You were talking about what do they do? When he starts talking about it, it goes in and it says, okay, first of all, when it's time to move, first people who go in is Moses and the priests. And they have instructions to cover up the Ark of the Covenant. First thing they do is they put this covering on it. And then they put another one of those skin coverings. It's difficult to translate. We talked about that when we were looking at the tabernacle, whether it was porpoise skin or sea cow skin or badger skin. You know, there's different translations. Sea animal of some sort, waterproof. This one was dyed blue. Then they would put coverings over the table of showbread and over the menorah and over the altar of incense. And then they would put all the poles in. Nobody else is allowed inside until they get all the coverings put in place and they get the poles inserted for, for carrying those things. And so when you look at it, We've got, first of all, this the ark and the veil and all of these things. The veil was actually used as part of the covering over the, the ark of the testimony. Um, and so inside of the tabernacle, that would have all been covered up. And then they would be turning loose and saying, okay, now we're ready for takedown. Even the Levites, if they went in too soon and says, the sons of Moses are doing this, the sons of Aaron are doing this because... Um, lest the, even the Levites die. So we've got quite a hierarchy here of, of protection that, that's going on. And then they start in, in with the, uh, the frames and the pillars and all of these things. The sons of Merari had, they were basically the hardware folks, okay? And then we had the sons of Gershon who were in charge of all of the hanging claws and, and the, the tent wrappings and things like that. So it talks about the numbers, and I, and I love the phrase that it has in Gershon. It says that everyone was assigned their piece. So you know how to do something really fast when you've got a lot of pieces like that starting up? It's when everybody's trained and they know exactly where they're supposed to go with their piece. And they had four wagons to carry all of the hardware stuff in, the, the posts and the pillars and, and, and the, the support structure. And the sons of Gershon had two wagons to carry all of the uh, cloth things, the, the, the wraps around. They were all folded up and they were all put in these other couple of wagons. And then the articles inside, and then even on the table show where it says, on there you put all of the sensors and the, and the various you know, shovels and pails and things that they use for moving ashes. All that was piled on there. Everything had its place. And everybody knew their role in this. And so think of it as like the swarm of ants, you know, that just kind of move in. And they take this thing down. Everybody knows where to fold it up. They know which slot on the wagon to, to put their piece of, of cloth or their, their particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, base that they're responsible for. And when it comes time to set up, what happens? Exactly in reverse, right? Everybody knows what they're responsible for. They know where it goes, so everybody comes out. Somebody's measuring a corner for where to start things, and then everybody just moves in and starts building right up. I suspect they could take this thing down and put it up fairly quickly. And they're going to have to, because they're going to be moving quite a bit <laughs> as they move from campsite to campsite. And this was when it was time to go. This was one of the first things that had to be dismantled <laughs> and taken down. And then when it was ready, then they had a marching order for what order the various tribes would move out and how they would march on. And I'm thinking it's a good day's work just to get it organized, to get everything packed up and get ready to go, right? And then the first parts can probably set out in the vanguard. They probably don't set out for another day or two because they're waiting for everybody else to you know, get on down the road a bit. 
So when you think about the logistics of what's going on here, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, but yeah, some of the stuff is covered. Some of it they weren't supposed to see. Um, and they, the holiness was maintained. You'll see also two colors that come in there. The most holy objects were covered in blue. The veil of the tab between the, uh, the holy place and the most holy place, that was purple. And the inside of there, it had purple linens that were twisted there. The front uh, opening to the tabernacle was purple. I had a good question asked the other night about the, the, the curtains around it. Those were linen. It doesn't specifically say white, but since they were fine twisted linen, that was the normal color. It was a bleached white. That was the idea there. It would be kind of a symbol of purity and the whiteness there. Uh, blue and purple, those were royal colors. Okay, so we see that set aside many times for things that were of importance, being blue and purple. Okay, so uh, hopefully you see an idea there as you start to get organized and start to organize all of this, that God has a plan for things. So even in how they were to set this thing up, how they were to take it down, it's all planned out. And everybody's got to get instructed and they're supposed to follow the plan. <laughs> Can you imagine two things? One, somebody goes, you know, I got a better idea. I think there's a different way we should do this. I know a more efficient way for whatever reason. What's going to happen to that guy? If you push, he's probably going to get his head chopped off, right? Okay, because. Excluded from Israel quite often. That's what they did. It was a permanent exclusion. God had what he wanted done. They were to do it that way. But secondly, he didn't leave anything out for these people. The details were there for what they needed. And how it was to be set up and how it was to be organized. And there was, there was a reason he gave in each one of those as you look around. All right. And we're out of time. So the first few chapters, we didn't read a lot of the text there. I encourage you to go ahead and read through it as we talked about some of these things. Um, but I think what you'll find is that it'll be a little more interesting with some of that background as you read through and think about God organizing these people in these first four chapters for the journey of these people. Yeah. I have uh, one last announcement that I failed to do when I was making the announcement, and that is I wanted to uh, point out new members Colin uh, and Nicole Ah, uh, yes, they're in the back. Right in there. there you go. And there, there are two boys, Gavin and Oliver, are in class right now, but I, that they uh, placed her a couple weeks ago and then said, we're going to be out of town. <laughs> so now they're back in town. I just wanted to make sure they weren't missed. All right. Questions? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to add about the logistics to all that. I kept running through my mind is if you've ever run a marathon, uh, just the San Antonio or the Dallas, when that gun goes off, you're waiting 30 minutes to an hour and a half before you ever start running. And the races that I've done, there has never been a single ox-driven cart. So <laughs> the logistics of moving two million people yeah, it's, anywhere, I'm sure you're sitting there maybe a day or two before you even move. Absolutely. It's mind-boggling in a way that when you think about all that went on there. And that's kind of what I was trying to get across this yeah. morning. Joe? You don't have to answer this because uh, we're out of time. but. If God was taking care of his people through all this years of wondering, why did they have to move so much? Ah, we'll get to that. Um, they probably didn't move that much once they got to Kadesh Barnea because that was their downfall. And looking further in the Bible when it talks about the, the camps and things, they probably spent 38 years near Kadesh Barnea. Um, the, the moving was just to get them where they were supposed to be. And then they failed when they got to Kadesh Barnea. So they spent 40 years in the wilderness. My view of the wilderness wanderings when I was a kid was two million people, single file, walking through the <laughs> desert, one by one, keeling over and falling off. And it says that their clothes didn't wear out their shoes, didn't, so somebody had to strip the clothes and the shoes as they were going on. <laughs> but God had a path for them, he had a place for them to go. And that was just part of his instructions for how to get them there. And then even as we looked at the tabernacle history, uh, and, and we can talk about that a little more in time comes, uh, we see it being set up in a couple, only a few different places once they got into the world. Okay, thank you.